Welcome to the Supporters Fund, Ask an Investor. I'm your host, Jeffrey Poppin, and let's please welcome Tiziana Bombassier. I hope I said that correct. Global Partnership ah. Manager at Seed Starts, our investor for today. Welcome, Tiziana. It's a real pleasure having you join us today. Thanks a lot. It's my pleasure to be with you today. Thanks for the invite. And congrats awesome. on the presentation. <laughs> It actually uh, kind of reminded me of uh, um, when going through Kenya, it kind of reminded me of Mombasa, uh, one of the cities there. So I was like, okay, if I can say this correctly, then I'm off the races. So, and that's a great city. I'm not sure if you've been there, but uh, in Kenya, in Nairobi, all the way to Mombasa, you can take a fantastic train that drives you. It's a big open train with big windows and you get to see all the landscape for about 11 hours, I think it was, if I remember correctly, all the way into Mombasa. So if you haven't checked it out, you're going to have to. <laughs> Let's definitely put that on the roadmap for 2023. I love it. I love it. Well, I'm excited to have you here today. There's lots of great things that we're going to dive into and chat about. Uh, but the way we kind of like to start our show is that we want to learn more about yourself. So perhaps um, we can kick it off by giving a little bit about your background all the way from even when you were in the United Nations, the junior consultant side to your own startup, because there's so much cool stuff that we can dive into uh, from all the great experiences that you've had, the schooling, and then one thing about you that nobody would know. Yeah, sure. Um, so let me start off by giving you a bit of background about myself. So I am a Belgian Italian uh, citizen for whatever that means, but I've been traveling around for the past 10 years now, a bit more, um, exclusively, nearly exclusively on emerging markets. So from Argentina to Colombia to then Egypt, Morocco, Lebanon, you name it. Um, and living in all these places. So I think that's really shaped the person I, I became. Um, and as you mentioned, I started off my journey in a more institutional place than the one I am in today. Um, I started off by studying uh, political science, international relations, um, then a bit of law, a bit of risk analysis, but so much more um, social sciences oriented. And so um, I ended up uh, working for the European Union and the United Nations um, in the Middle East, working on uh, on Middle Eastern and uh, and African topics, um, so mostly public policy, etc. And but at the same time, I always had a foot somehow in the entrepreneurial world. But back then, it was really not clear to me. I wasn't really realizing that that entrepreneurial seed was already there, right? Um, but but as you mentioned, I had been launching during my studies, um, Change Makers International, which was a a gap year program, so it was pretty much a, a program hosted by a university in Costa Rica called the UN um, Mandated University for Peace, UPeace. And we had set up that social entrepreneurship um, gap year program for students. Uh, we were mostly targeting students from, um, from the US um, who wanted to spend a year between high school and, um, and university studying, learning a new language, um, being outside of their comfort zone a bit in, in a foreign country. Um, and, and in parallel, the year after, I had also supported um, a French, this time company, um, launched their spin-off. Um, they were a headhunting company and wanted to essentially not have any waste in the talents that they had spent time with. And so they wanted to redirect the talents that they ended up not working with um, in a closed way and redirect them um, through a company. And so they tasked me to launch that company on the French market. Um, these two projects, so the, 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 the one in France is still alive. It's not a high growth company, but it's still a business that's running and that complements the activity. The one in Costa Rica, unfortunately, um, did not make it through because of regulatory hurdles. We were working with people who were um, under 18. Um, and that included a bunch of insurances, et cetera, which we ended up not uh, managing. So that project never um, never really saw the light. We launched it, we tried it, but then it, I mean, it didn't, it did, didn't quite take off, um, which is interesting because I'm now again with Seed Stars working on other educational projects also in, uh, in, uh, in emerging markets. We can come to it later. Anyway, so started institutional, always had a foot um, in the entrepreneurial world. And today um, I am fully, I think, in the entrepreneurial slash investors world um, because I joined a company called Seed Stars nearly four years ago. 
Um, and Seedstar is a company that is on a mission to have a positive impact on emerging markets through on the one hand entrepreneurship and on the other hand tech. And so that essentially uh, means we have activities articulated around two, um, two big axes. The first one is access to capital, so venture capital. And the other one is what we could call education. So either education, um, tertiary education or education in the sense of capacity building for already existing entrepreneurs. So that's a long intro about myself, but that's pretty much my, my background, um, where, where I've spent time, what I've been focusing on over, um, over the past few years. One thing nobody knows about me, um, I turned my pasta in the wrong side, which for an Italian is quite a strange thing to do. Um, it's a, a random fun fact, but that's one thing that nobody knows about me. I turned my pasta the other way around. Try it when you eat, it's super hard to shift the sense. Um, I, I, I've never, uh, I've never heard that. I, that's, I'm going to try that. That's I fascinating. Mean, ask something nobody knew. That's a, that's the one yeah. thing nobody ever asks. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I love it. I love it. Uh, okay. So I want to kind of take back and peel back to some of these things. So when I started to kind of go through your profile, and I know when we, you and I met in Cairo, uh, we got to be on the stage a couple of times and it was really awesome. Just the way that everything was structured uh, at the conference and, and the questions and the things that we got to talk to. And, and one of the topics, um, uh, I guess, uh, being that it was um, kind of women and where they're going in this venture space and just overall in general, um, which was pretty exciting for myself being that there was three panelists and one guy. So it was kind of cool um, that we got to kind of share different elements of how we all viewed the world and where this was taking us. Um, but when I started to go through and learn more about, and you just kind of uh, tailored that, that in the last 10 years, you've traveled a lot. There is so much really cool parts. We could almost do a travel show before we uh, dive into all of the venture stuff. But um, I, I, the reason why I really like this is because uh, myself, I also venture to a lot of different countries and go into the ecosystems from startups to investors uh, and meet people along the way. But from the areas that you have been in the MENA region, um, and you said there are more breakout areas. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about that because uh, I also really believe that there is a huge opportunity in the African continent, the MENA region, which is the Middle East, that there is, you know, there's still a few years behind the rest of the world on big tech and deep tech, um, fintech age spaces, but there is a lot happening. Uh, there is a lot of dollars starting to come into the market. And maybe you can share some of your experiences from the time you were building this out in Costa Rica. Uh, which Costa Rica obviously comes to mind more like a surf town than it does uh, going into deep tech and, and high innovation. But starting in there and kind of working your way up to um, probably Lebanon, because uh, I was recently there and I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of Lebanon. So uh, I, I love to talk about that. But just maybe a couple of points on what you experienced in these different um, communities and where you're seeing them go today from the Costa Rica um, and throughout the Middle East. Yeah, it's a very good region, you know, um, I'm, I'm often in, in, uh, in Europe because I'm still European. Um, and when I'm in Europe and I say, yeah, I work with startups and we invest and we see whatever people are like, wow, that's so, um, it's so like marketing, it's so shiny, it's so bright, so sexy, whatever. But I don't think people really realize what it means to be launching a business on emerging markets, right? It means opening up your bank account is a nightmare. It means setting up a company is a nightmare. It means finding talent is nearly impossible, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the big, um, I think the big learning from all these years of traveling around these regions is setting something up takes double the effort or maybe triple, I don't know. Um, but it takes a lot of effort in comparison to what people think of startups in more um, in more developed economies where um, the infrastructure essentially to set up a company is much easier, where every everything essentially is, is, uh, is much easier. Um, so, so I think that's one big learning. And the other big learning is if you look at emerging markets today, in every region, there is at least one country that will make its way to the top um, to the to the top countries in the world in terms of world population, right? The demographics of these regions are are huge. They're just immense. So there is an an increasing need to serve these populations and to meet their demands. So you all of a sudden have this massive, massive, massive demand that you need to serve, 
and you have very few people that have the ability to actually launch a company or that have the braveness sometimes to, to overcome the hurdles of setting up um, a company. So I think, yeah, I think big learning is the courage it takes to, to be an entrepreneur in these countries and, and the opportunity that is just gigantic. I mean, you, you, walk, in, uh, you walk in the streets in Egypt, you walk in the streets um, in some other um, African or, or Latin American Asian cities, and you're like, wow, how many people can we serve in this market, right? And I think that's really what underlies every single business creation in uh, in these regions um then i can go more in detail into latin america I mean africa whatever but maybe it's uh that, that would take us 24 hours at least no for sure but that's that's some great learning that uh, you're seeing that even in emerging markets it really comes down to the founder being able to figure out how they can get in there start to build uh, and build something that's going to create the masses to have interest. And do they have the technology ability to be, or the innovation ability uh, to be able to connect with all of these people? Like you said, when you're walking around Cairo, it's a massive, massive city, but is everybody utilizing the same systems? Uh, or are you only servicing 5% of the, the economy because they only are the ones that have the mobile technology that are enabled enough so that your platform can operate and, and so forth? Um, and I guess uh, when you're working in these environments and, and you start to look at different types of investments that uh, you can make over the years, are you finding that uh, economies are really just trying to put in as much money as they can into these areas uh, so that they can build the talent pool and start to build out the technology? Um, or do you think they're still way behind and that there still needs a lot more venture capital or money being pushed into these regions? Look, it's a very good question. I think um, I think countries are are obviously doing efforts, and and we have seen countries that did great efforts and and that made their way up there. You know, I'm thinking um, I'm thinking of Korea, for example. I mean, these are countries that really exploded all the the records in terms of of going as far as they could in in supporting their population, in creating a virtuous economy, etc. But it's hard. It's hard because in a lot of countries, sometimes you don't have the the political elite to do that in some other countries you don't have the financial means to do that and 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 it's a bit um it, it's a bit the, the, the snake that bites its own tail right like it's a tricky um it's a tricky neck mechanism so i definitely think we need the private sector to step up and to also be part of of that change and and for sure um startups can play a role in that change and for sure venture capital is needed um to to play a role um, at Seed Stars, we really try to focus on high growth companies. Um, and, and essentially, these are companies that have the potential to make a disproportionate difference on the market that they serve. Why do we aim for, for high growth companies? We aim for them because um, statistics have shown that approximately 6% of the companies, so a tiny portion of the companies, are the ability to create 50% of the job market over time in the geographies that they serve. So these are typically the type of companies that, um, that we want to see grow, right? But then, of course, high growth companies are only a tiny portion of small and growing businesses. Um, but then if we zoom out a bit and look at these small and growing businesses, we still see that they contribute to a significant um, portion of the positive impact in at least in emerging and frontier markets, which are the markets I know best. Um, and they do that by creating jobs, driving um, inclusive, inclusive economic growth. Um, I mean, all these mechanisms, virtuous mechanisms, essentially of creating value on a market versus trying to grasp the value that's already existing. So you create something that does not exist yet. The tricky part is, of course, um, the venture capital part that you just mentioned, because these companies do struggle to access the capital that they need to reach their full potential. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think the IMF the, or the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, um, recently published a stat that says that the financing gap for these com companies only, so only if we look at small and growing businesses, we would need an emerging market, 930, I think, um, billion USD. So it's a massive amount, right? The, the financing gap is, is huge. The opportunity is massive. But these companies, the missing middle, 
really needs the support of, uh, of, of capital to come in and of talent pools, et cetera. And I think, again, this should be an effort, a public-private effort, an effort of governments together with in international institutions, together with the private sector. Um, and definitely VC is a new asset class. It's, it's, uh, it's tricky to, to, to be able to call it essentially an asset class and to build it up that way. But it's going there, and and I think it's uh, it's definitely great. Uh, it's a great point that it is going there. I, I think this is becoming uh, a really interesting asset class that probably didn't exist so much ten years ago for everybody, and today it, it's being sought after by certainly a lot more people when they're diversifying their portfolio to make investments into this category. Um, Maybe not so much in the emerging markets like the African continent, et cetera, because th th they still kind of have to go through those ebbs and flows of fails and uh, big businesses taking off and other ones uh, not making it. Um, I guess you have to have corrections everywhere. Um, but I think the, the main one that you talked about really comes down to is, is the talent pool. And, you know, it, I think from a government perspective, they spend their time trying to put money into schools and education so that the talent can grow and they can get into these companies. Um, and then if they can start funding venture capital to start putting money into these businesses as well, then it doesn't become so much metric based on what companies succeed. It also becomes on uh, even if companies fail, that also is a great metric because you've just educated more people. You've brought that talent pool uh, further along. So now the next company, the next company is where you're going to see the most value that comes out of these uh, merging regions. Um, and you know, I think Google put five or six hundred million into uh, Kenya into Nairobi to, to start pushing that market. Uh, you've got um, Nigeria where they have a massive, massive growth happening within the startup community. Rwanda and a few others where they are a bit smaller and they're starting to kind of break through that space um, and solving uh, problems as well. And I think when you start to look at the landscape and all the countries you've been through, I'm sure there's a few markets that you see that are really getting a lot of exposure um, and maybe share a few points on why they're getting exposure. And, and um, I can say that today I was having a conversation with, um, uh, with a potential uh, new founder and they're looking at the world and saying, you know, maybe Canada is not the right spot. Maybe the U.S. is the right spot. And now you've got all these new digital nomad uh, startup visas that are coming out from Spain, Portugal, Turkey. Everybody's now starting to say, wait a second, maybe we can draw attention and draw capital into our environment if we allow the global exposure to entrepreneurship and get them coming to our country. Even they're doing this in Italy. Um, in a small region as well, because they're really trying to draw that attention. So I think there's a lot of the world that's changing over the last few years on trying to move people in and generate talent. Um, and, and I think that's obviously a great thing. A few points where uh, you see kind of where that cities or countries that are really diving in and what they're doing right. For sure. No, no, I think you're you're completely right. Huh? If we want to continue, just to, again to tie to tie both conversations, so the, the VC conversation and the talent one. If we look at the amount of VC backed companies in 2017, um, there were approximately 500 VC backed companies in emerging markets, and and in 2021, so the numbers of last year, we saw that um, the number had quadrupled. Right, we were at we were at 2,000 uh, VC backed companies on emerging markets, and. It, you're right. If we want to see that trend growing, if we want to see a survival rate of companies growing, we do need education to be um, to be on point. We do need talents to be on the market. And I think, I mean, there are many there are many trends to piggyback to piggyback on um, in in that vein. Right. The first one is having founders that have been VC backed means that we can hope to have. Um, second time, third time founders very soon, right? We are going to witness that second or third generation in some countries of founders, while other countries are still going to have their first wave of founders, but they're going to have inspiration from the country right next door that has had second time founders. So you create essentially people who are trained to launching companies. Um, so, so I think that's definitely one thing. So learning on the job, but then of course you have the, the, the schooling system, the education system. How do you make sure that your education system reflects the needs of the market? And, and from the policy perspective, it's really hard to do, right? Because most of the jobs that, um, that, that the people are gonna get once they graduate do not exist yet 
I mean, the, the technology and, and the society is moving so fast that we cannot foresee. So what do we need to train people on? And if I were a minister of education, I think this would be my biggest question mark. What do I need to train the new generation on? And I think um, I think it's, it starts with really taking the approach of teaching people how to learn. And it's not so much teaching people how to learn. It's much more giving them an eagerness to learn how to learn. How do you put yourself as an individual in a position where you are going to learn? Um, and, and it's really how we've set up um, the, the pace of work over um, over the past year with, with a small team working on, a, on, on new models that would complement ecosystems. Um, and we now launched our first Seed Stars Academy in the Ivory Coast, you were mentioning Africa. Um, uh, and, and the plan is to launch uh, our next campus in, uh, in India in Q1. And Seed Stars Academy has as an aim to precisely support talents learn how to learn. So the aim is that when the talents graduate, they are able to join a company, launch their own business, but most importantly, they're able to be agile and to go out on their own and figure out the way to do what they want to do. Um, and I think all of this goes is, I mean, all of this is backed by science. Huh? It's it, Science has proven that the way we learn, the way that you and I sat down in a classroom is not the most efficient way to do things. It's not the most opportunistic way to learn. So how do we make sure that edu the educational systems evolve as fast as the market, as our societies? And that's really part of the challenge. And, and so we've taken, uh, we've taken the approach of going with very unique methodologies um, that are methodologies that we're not used to seeing. So now you, what we're proposing is not to imagine a classroom with a teacher, with students sitting down, with exams, with grades, et cetera. Instead, we are envisioning massive spaces with at least 70 to 300 people minimum um, learning through peer-to-peer -peer methodologies, through gamified um, curriculas without getting grades. Um, people who essentially want to go through challenges and learn by doing, learn by experimenting, learn by feeling for yourself. Um, and, and I think that's really where education is going towards. We're not going towards more and more diploma. We're going towards micro-certification, towards learning and sitting down in a classroom only when we are stuck in our learning path. Um, and, and so definitely, I think we need many more, um, many more education, um, education innovations, many more entrepreneurs going into that direction if we want to cater for the needs of the companies that we see launch on emerging markets and thus um, cater to the demand of the VCs that are now launching on emerging markets, because that's another green trend. That's awesome. And to take that in a nutshell, it's basically looking at it almost like from a startup lens or an accelerator lens. You're really looking at education and saying, look, this is how we build companies through an accelerator. So why don't we use the same methodology on how we educate people? So go get your base root education, which is your baseline, which is maybe up to, say, grade 12. And then once you go into the real world, university and college, let's just form factor that into how you would build a startup. So instead of going out and learning these things in different classroom settings, let's just bucket it all and say, hey, if you're going to learn this way, we're going to treat it uh, like a startup and we're going to treat it like you're accelerating uh, your math learning or your financial learning and we're going to treat it like we would a startup. And, and I think that makes a lot of sense because you're trying to take them later from this education piece and stick them into a startup. And they're saying, well, I don't understand how all this works and why are we doing it this way? Um, and now if you just start right at the beginning it, doing these case studies in high school and then building them in, into the university uh, curriculum, they're going to learn faster so that when they do go into the real world of entrepreneurship or even business, they're going to look at problems completely different. They're going to look at life differently because uh, life is going to be about networking. It's going to be about how you solve micro problems instead of big problems and break things down, which is how you learn in an accelerator on how to move your business into a real business because when you go in it's kind of this high level i think i'm solving this problem and then you kind of keep building it all the way down until you find that right stream of uh, of model that you're going after a hundred percent no you're completely right and you know it's it's really funny because the academic world has been researching that and has proven that this is the way to go 
And the market has been demanding that, but the bridge that education is hasn't adapted to that yet. So we're really trying now to um, to lift that barrier and to build that bridge, which is very novel. And it's, it, I mean, it comes with all the entrepreneurial hurdle, but it's exactly, um, it's exactly what you what you mentioned. And I think one thing I didn't um, focus on is that to, for a start, we're really focusing on tech because we still think that tech abilities are a key to catering to um, the largest number of people um, in, in, in the markets that the future entrepreneurs or employees are gonna are gonna become so we're, we still have that tech edge on top um which ties in also with the whole high growth companies um thesis that is overarching or, or activities it's amazing well i think the it sounds like the way you've built out this model it's really uh, conducive to the way that businesses should start and the way that founders should really dive into learning about their business and learning about how to scale and grow uh, so I think that's pretty exciting. Um, I guess the the last kind of um, question or interest I would have is that when you're working in these different environments, are you finding that the startup communities lag behind each other, behind the European startups? Uh, do you find that you really have to take drastic measures in order to ramp up the education or ramp up the, the style or the way founders are building their companies, say, from a Morocco to a uh, of France, like do you see staggering differences, or do you find that the education system and the way that it's operating today it gets them to a baseline that is constructive enough that allows for you guys to jump in and be able to catapult them no problem whatsoever um, when you start working in these regions? Mm -hmm. No, so it's a it's a very good question. Um, first of all, you the first question you asked was, do you think that these companies and these markets are lagging behind? Uh, regions like Europe, et cetera. I don't think it's, I don't think lagging behind is the right word, word in the sense that they simply do not have access to the same thing. So you're not lagging behind if you don't have the same opportunities, right? It's not you who's lagging behind, it's the system that's lagging behind a bit. Um, so, so I think that's the really the first element and, and it's maybe part of, or the start of the answer to your next question, which is, um, do you have to adapt from one country to, to another the way that you um, essentially convey um, ways of building businesses with entrepreneurs, the answer is definitely yes, you need to adapt, which is a bit the tricky part, right? Because when you launch a business, you want it to be standardized. You want it to, um, to work in the same way for everybody, for every market. That's definitely the dream, but then it's not how it works in reality. It is true that if you are going to work with an entrepreneur in Iraq, it's not going to be the same needs as an entrepreneur in Morocco or in Argentina. It's it's going to be very different. So you can reuse frameworks, you can reuse ways to build businesses. And here I'm thinking experimentation is universal. But then what you're going to be experimenting on is very different because unfortunately you don't really have the same um, the same systems to experiment on, right? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are billions of examples, but the, the structure in terms of human capital, in terms of access to finance, in terms of support systems, I'm thinking community, I'm thinking investors are very different. Um, you have regulatory um, regulatory hurdles that are also hard to overcome in, in a few countries. I mean, um, I, I was uh, the other day I was talking to an entrepreneur launching an e-commerce in Iraq, precisely. And, and the guy tells me, you know, like I'm stuck with my business, like I'm ready to launch, but I'm stuck because um, the bank doesn't have the little box e-commerce to tick when I want to open my bank account. So the guy is just not able to start because the bank is not able to add the box on their drop, um, or on, on, their, uh, on their drop menu, right? I mean, these are the type of struggles. And I mean, here it's a tiny example, right? But these are the type of struggles. So you cannot replicate one system in another and you cannot replicate one methodology to another. And it's definitely also the approach that Seedstars has taken of going in the markets and starting by understanding which market am I on? What is the need? And that explains um, why very often people come up to us and they're like, wow, you guys do everything, right? You do expansion programs and at the same time you do incubation programs and at the same time you run funds and at the same time you launch education systems. Well, yes, the answer is yes, because the needs are very different. And if we go in a market, it, it doesn't make sense to launch a growth program if all the companies are at incubation stage. 
And it doesn't make sense to launch the incubation program that you'd run in Paris if you are launching it in Mali. It just does not make sense. So for sure, it requires a lot of uh, a lot of adaptations, but each time on different um, on different topics. And now for sure, in Ivory Coast and in India, we've decided to um, start off with education, tech education, entrepreneurial education, because we see that there is a potential in the market to then quickly join the market, grow companies. In other regions, we've decided that acceleration was the, the right go-to because you had a bunch of incubated companies, but that they were missing that extra step before being able to raise funds, et cetera, et cetera. That's awesome. Uh, I'm uh, I'm learning so much about how you guys would operate in these in the foreign markets, but I think it also opens up to how a foreign market has potential. Uh, because there are barriers to overcome and, you know, there's not a lot of fintechs in the Cairo space, but that's because, you know, they have a lot of uh, regulatory issues that they're working through. So, but they are working through them, which is a good thing. So businesses or venture firms like yourselves are pushing them and pushing the envelope so that like in Iraq, they'll be able to check that box off. Um, just like, like when I was looking to go to uh, travel into Iran, uh, you can't just go there. You have to do a, I have to be there and uh, handheld by somebody at the hire someone to take me around, which again, makes no sense. But in time, you'll be able to get a visa at the door um, or a, a box on the uh, applying for a visa just going into, into India was the same. There was a checkbox that was missing for Canada, which makes it uh, very tough to obviously get a visa. But these are the little things that make a big difference in a company or a business trying to uh, to create a venture and move forward. So businesses like yours are really enabling this and pushing the envelope to help uh, communities and governments come together and better understand what they're lacking or what they're missing um, while you're ramping up that knowledge base at the same time so that you can get a lot more founders uh, bringing more value to the, to the country, which is creating jobs, resources, and dollars and cents uh, through the business or through the country. For sure, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think one framework that nicely captures all of that is it, the Eisenberg model that essentially breaks down um, the entrepreneurial ecosystem into various elements and then sub factors, etc. And what we did is, um, so we traveled the world a lot with sisters and meet a lot of companies. Um, and so with the whole database of thousands and thousands of entrepreneurs, what we've done is we've tried to classify the, um, the markets according to the Eisenberg model. It's called Seedstars Index, available online. So if anybody uh, on the podcast is uh, is eager to learn more, don't hesitate to, uh, to Google it. That's awesome. I'm going to Google that. Uh, okay, so last question before we uh, transition. Uh, there was a recent announcement within your business. Uh, within the venture firm, maybe you can give us a, a quick high level um, on the excitement around that. Uh, I think everybody would love to learn more about um, what you guys are looking to do in the future. Yeah, sure. Um, yes, yeah, so you're right. Seed Stars announced three weeks ago, I think now, um, the launch of Seed Stars Capital, um, which is a platform focused on developing rising managers across em emerging markets. So the idea is pretty much, um, if I simplify it a bit, we want to incubate um, emerging managers in emerging markets because we think that's one of the ways to bring more capital um, to uh, to the emerging VC ecosystems. Um, and, and the underlying rationale is really that we believe that early stage investors will be the ones betting on local entrepreneurs. They will be the ones looking at what happens for them at home. Um, and and on top of that, you've met a lot of, uh, of fund managers um, over the course of your career. We also see that there is a need for diversity um, in, the, in, the, um, in, in the type of investors that we see in emerging markets, and we see an increasing number. And it's precisely what you hooked me with, right? The first time we met, I remember you told me, you are a female, you are working in VC, can I host a podcast with you? Because I do not find female in VC, and, and it's precisely all of these topics um, that we want to tackle. Of course, not only gender-based, I mean, it can be a, a billion things, right? But this diversity is important because it is also what is going to um, enable the investors to then invest in, in corresponding companies. Um, and then, of course, we also want to create uh, opportunities for talents and all of that. I mean, all that value chain of the investor investing in an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur investing in talents, et cetera, is very intimately linked, right? 
Um, so the, the way that we think of designing um, this, uh, the way that we designed this platform um, is through partnerships. So essentially we partner with managers, fund managers, and we become a part of their fund. So we act as the third GP in the fund, if you want, and we provide them um, with the entire resources of the SeedStars ecosystem. So that is access to programs, mentors, experts, um, to the technology platform that we have in-house, to the fund creation facilitation and uh, at the admin process to even deal flow. Um, yeah, and so on top of that, so, the, so, so we can imagine it as a platform, right? You would have SeedStars Capital that hosts um, what we have called the SeedStars Catalyst, which is a fund um, for investors to allocate funds in the managers in the platform. And then that Catalyst funds then goes and um, goes and uh, and supports funds. So we are not a fund of fund. We support the manager. So it's very different in the approach and in the intention that lies behind the project. Um, so yeah, so the, the goal essentially of the SeedStars Capital Platform is to channel as much um, as much capital as possible into rising managers. Um, and the scope remains the, the traditional seed star scope. So Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, the Middle East and North Africa, as well as Central um, and Eastern Europe. And to give you uh, to give you maybe an overview, so thus far we have uh, we have four funds that are under uh, under the platform. Um, so we have the Seed Stars International Venture Fund, which is our our, um, our legacy, let's call it um, fund. Uh, we have Seed Stars Africa Ventures that uh, you might have come across during your travels on the Afri African continent. Then we have um, Seed Stars Uru Ventures that will focus more on the CEE region. Um, and we have an additional two funds in uh, in the pipeline, one which will focus on education precisely in uh, Latin America and, uh, and the next one on supply chain. So to all uh, to all emerging uh, to all emerging uh, GPs, please don't hesitate to have a look. Be in touch. Um, we're really here to to try and be catalytic. Catalytic, sorry, in the in the in the VC space. I love it. I love it. Well, we'll make sure that we do give a shout out uh, to all of the GPs to share with this as well, because I think that's very exciting. Uh, it's a great way to integrate into uh, into these uh, founding um, managers and and help them expand and get into the right regions and, and get into the right opportunities. So very exciting. Well, we're going to transition now into kind of like a case study, I guess. And, you know, you've worked with a lot of founders and you've talked with a lot of startups around the world. Is there one founder or startup that, or just generalizing um, that is really kind of hit home with you that really kind of defines what it takes to be an entrepreneur, um, like someone that she or he literally went to bat and he thought, oh, this is going to work and, you know, took off like a rocket ship. We always like to hear a, a good story of what it takes. If if you have something, we'd love to hear and share something that can uh, invigorate the next founder to uh, to get out there and uh, work a little harder. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's a tricky question. You know, I, I think I've met thousands of entrepreneurs by now, um, and and it would be hard to handpick one. Um, but but maybe what's interesting is um, if I speak to the entrepreneurial archetype, what I think it takes to be a good entrepreneur, essentially, and I think it takes two crucial things. Um, the first one is your culture of experimentation and to be tolerant towards failure. We've talked about it a bit and, and around this education discussion that we just had. I think if you are able to experiment, if you are able to learn that your idea sometimes is not the right idea, that the hack you had found for your business sometimes isn't the right hack or is the right hack. But if you learn it by doing, by experimenting, I think it's definitely a win for your company. And failing is fine. Failing is learning. So why, why are we afraid of failing? I mean, it's this is also a preconception that we got in school, right? Saying you you failed. Well, no, you didn't fail. You learned that you need to work harder on, on your math exam, right? Um, so, so, so this culture of experimentation and tolerance towards failure, I think, is, is critical. Um, and the second element is the growth mindset. Um, if you don't have a growth mindset, I think it's really hard to be entrepreneurial. Um, and again, here I really speak to tech startups. Um, I, 
right? I don't speak of, of other more uh, bread and butter uh, or pop and mom shop, right? But the growth mindset, I think, is essential to your entrepreneurial um, journey. And I think, um, I, I think if I were to cite one entrepreneur, I would cite actually a lot of entrepreneurs, but I think the whole Seed Stars team and culture, and, and I think it's definitely a big job on, on the founders and on the partners at Art Seed Stars, is very entrepreneurial. We are we are going to turn ten years this year, and and um, and our CEO made a presentation last week, um, showing us the various business models that have been tested over the past uh, over the past ten years, and 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 showing the, the evolution or the death of some of these business models, and and really showing okay these were the key assumptions that didn't work that worked, and this is why today we are launching capital and we are launching schools, and this is why we. You know the co-working space, co-working spaces around the globe were maybe not a good idea or or, or not a, a venture that was meant to succeed. Um, and I think the the reason why I chose these entrepreneurs to and shed light on them today is because the impact they had is immense in the sense that them alone were able to impact so many entrepreneurs by themselves living by these two. Um, by these two values, the growth mindset and the culture of experimentation, right? Um, and, and that maybe takes us to the third element of your entrepreneurial um, your entrepreneurial archetype, which is try to do good not only for you, but to do good in a way that you're able to have a ripple effect on, on as many people as possible, be it your customers or your beneficiaries in certain cases. Well said. I love it. Those are uh, three great points, experimentation, growth, and uh, do good for everybody, not just for yourself. I think that's a, a good mantra to live by. Um, well, we're going to transition now into rapid fire questions. So the way they work is you're coming in as the investor. So you pick one or the other on what you prefer from the business standpoint, meaning as the venture firm, what you choose as being the option uh, a or B is better for, for you guys. Cool. Go. All right. Founder or co-founder? Co-founder. Unicorn or a four-year 10X exit? Four-year 10X exits. Tech or CPG? Hmm, tech. NFTs or Web 3.0? <laughs> That's a tricky one. NFTs. AI or blockchain? Blockchain. First time founder or second, third time founder? Third time founder. Uh, first uh, money in or series A? First money in. Angel or VC? VC. Board seat or observer? Board seat. Safe or convertible note? Safe. Lead or follow? Follow. Equity or interest payments? Equity. Favorite part of investing? Mm, favorite part of investing, the founder. Uh, number of companies invested per year? Uh, 30 to 40, 35 to be half. <laughs> You're crushing the standards. Uh, per, any preferred terms? Uh, um, case by case. You've mentioned uh, verticals of focus. Maybe you can reiterate what those would be. Yeah. Um, verticals of focus could be, a, let's say, let's make it simple. Future of commerce, uh, financial services, um, retail, future of health to some extent. Essentially everything that's able to have a, a disproportionate impact on the populations. Okay. And then uh, you mentioned a couple of things that founders need, two qualities a startup needs in order to stand out to you. Founder market fit. Um, and experimentation slash growth mindset. I love it. Okay, we're going to do the personal side now. Book or movie? Book. Wonder Woman or Robin? 
<laughs> what are women? <laughs> it could be <laughs> Batman or Superman, so you get to choose. I'm trying to change it up. I was trying to throw in some uh, more politically correct terms. Obviously, they didn't work very well, but <laughs> I tried. I tried. Restaurant or picnic? Ah, uh, picnic. Five minutes with Bezos or Oprah? Oprah. Mountain or beach? Uh, both. <laughs> Mountain. No beach. Beach. Let's say beach. So. Uh, bike or run? Bike. Big Mac or Chicken McNuggets? Chicken nuggets. Trophy or money? Trophy. Beer or wine? You ask a Belgian Italian, come on, wine. <laughs> That's true. It, well, it, there's a mix there, so exactly. it's a tough one. Uh, camera or mobile phone? Mobile phone. Uh, king, queen, or rich? Mm, rich by far no pepperoni <laughs> concert or amusement park concert fortune cookie or birthday cake mm, birthday cake ted talk or book reading ted talk tiktok or instagram instagram facebook or linkedin linkedin most favorite person that pops in your mind Oof. Uh, good question. Mm, favorite person? Can I cite like my whole family? <laughs> well, you can. You could say favorite or famous too. So you, you choose Musk. which one Musk. works best. Musk. Okay. okay. Favorite movie and character you'd play? Um, that's a tricky one. Favorite movie and the character I'd play. Ah, it's a tricky one. Can I say for a book? Favorite book is the next question. You can share that one too. Uh, the, girl, the, the Girl with the Bead um, from Telling the Story of Vermeeren and I'd be the protagonist, the girl who paints the famous guy and tries to set him up in the way that, um, that it works nicely for him. And it's called The Girl with the Beat? La Fille à la Perle in French. Yeah, I think it's uh, that's that cool. Thing. I haven't uh, heard that one, so I like it. Uh, favorite brand that pops into your mind? Patagonia these days. It's a good brand. <laughs> Mainstream, but you know. Hey, it's still good. It's good. I like it. Favorite sports team? Ah. Uh. Tricky. Uh, favorite sports team? I let's say the Argentinian team because they just won the World Cup. I like it. I, I was actually going to make that suggestion and say, well, it's kind of prevalent. It's at top of mind right now. Exactly. Uh, we're almost there. Uh, what is the meaning of success to you? Learning. I like it. And last question, what is your superpower? My superpower? I'm able to sleep for 13 hours in a row. And I think it's that's pretty good really sleeping. in life. <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty good superpower. I've never heard that one, but it sounds like a pretty good superpower. I'm going to say you're also very good at breaking things down and being able to uh, ask great questions and... Uh, can conduct and can and manage a room. So I think that's also a pretty big skill set uh, from my experience uh, in, in working beside you. But I also think that that other skill set is probably good for uh, giving you a lot of energy, which again, goes back to the same fashion of helping you do all these great things. So um, I'm going to say that uh, uh, they're all great. And um, Tiziana, it was amazing to have you walk through and share all of your experience and everything that you've done. I've made some amazing long footed notes. I don't even know if you can see them there, <laughs> but I ran out of paper actually. Uh, but uh, I want to, I want to say thank you very much again for coming on the, onto our show and sharing. Uh, there's a lot of great learning there. 
Uh, I'm excited and, and find that it's so cool that you've been traveling to all of these countries, uh, gaining all of this background and experience. I think that is phenomenal. And I think it's so helpful uh, in any any fashion in life uh, to be able to build and learn on these different cultures and especially in the startup ecosystem and the adventure side. Absolutely phenomenal. So thank you again for joining us and sharing today. The way we like to end our show is we want to give you the last word. So anything that you want to share to the investor community, to the startups, I turn it over to you. And please also share how people can get a hold of you at the same time. Yeah. First of all, thanks a lot for having me as well. Um, people can have a hold of me on LinkedIn. Um, Tiziana Francesca Bombasse. Don't hesitate. And um, I, well, I guess the word of the end is really one thing that I try to live by, which is do things because you believe in them, do things by passion, do things because you have the knack to wake up and to and to do them, right? Don't settle for less than what your than what your expectations of yourself are. I love it. Well shared. All of these uh, pieces that you've shared are very well uh, stated. Thank you again for all of your time. And uh, we hope to have you back again in the future. But thank you again for sharing. Thanks a lot, Jeffrey. Oh, that was great. I, I think uh, Tiana shared a lot of great insights around what it takes to be a founder in, in many different countries, of course, and uh, the different types of uh, areas where they can get a kind of pushback or stuck from regulators to um, you know, knowledge transfer and not being able to find the right talent. So there's so much opportunity for governments uh, and business to step up and, and start to put money back in the ecosystem and educate people from universities and colleges and, and help everybody kind of push that envelope and, and learn and fail. Um, I really like the, the three spots that she talked about, which is experimentation, growth, and the third one, which was do good for, you know, for the world and, and overall. So what's good for you has got to be good for everybody else. So push out the uh, the right metrics and the right value and, and help others grow. Uh, I think overall, the the what they're doing um, at Seed Stars is fantastic. They're really getting into markets, educating, growing, pushing the limits and, and helping markets open up further and quicker. And that brings in a lot more venture uh, and a lot more investors. So it's very exciting to see. Um, exciting about their uh, their new launch, um, the press release that came out. So another great um, pinnacle for their 10 years. Uh, so kudos to, to everybody over at Seed Stars. Um, and um, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, if you've enjoyed this conversation, please feel free to share with your friends or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and or Stitcher. Feel free to share an audio or video clip around our show, and we may include it in one of our future podcasts. Find us at marketing at openpeoplenetwork.com. Your support and comments are truly appreciated. You can also check us out at supportersfund.com or for startup events, visit openpeoplenetwork.com. Thank you and have a fantastic day.